Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Daily Dot presents The Loadout. Wow. The Loadout presented by The Daily Dot, as I mentioned. That's capital T, capital D, capital D. I am, as I always am, your loyal host, Jared Wynn, bringing you one more night of esports discussion, debate, diatribes, and all things like that. I am joined today by, as you can see, at my very side, the one, the only, Ian Double John Barker, freshly unearthed from a tomb sealed deep within the Austin <laughs> mines and catacombs we have here, That's correct. local to us, yep. brought to you now to, to help engage you in the wonderful esports diatribes that we have here. That Ian, do you feel prepared for, for this moment? No, not even a little. I'm in this multi-million dollar esports studio. I'm sitting next to uh, one of esports' biggest celebrities. I, all I could say it's, it's, a, it's a humbling experience to be here. You should be humbled. You seem humble. You actually look humble. Do I look humble? Yeah, you do. You look very <laughs> humble right now. And I know why. Because we're also joined by the one, the only, Sir Richard Lewis. Uh, Richard, how are you today? Uh, li literally just got through the door. Um, classic post-event voice and uh, lethargy. Uh, but uh, plenty to talk about. The sports drama just keeps on rolling. So where there is drama, there I shall be. It is. The, the uh, drama is reliable, if nothing else. You can always count on that. And if you want to be relying on anything, it's drama in your life. That's Indeed. A good, that's a good thing to be relying on. Let's get right into it, actually. With some not so much drama, but just some exciting events from the weekend. You were there yourself in Germany to see Hellraisers defeat Mouseports in a best of seven with a comeback mm. from 3-1, winning Indeed. three maps in a row to take this event. <laughs> a marathon for Hellraisers. They actually played a series before the series with Mouseports. Yep. So, I mean, uh, and they went, a map, they went a map down in yeah. that series. Yeah, they played, so they... I think, nine maps in a row, something like that, was it? Yeah. Like, they just and they ended up winning somehow. They came out on the other side of that with a victory. Um, I thought Moo is Moo Mao. How does he pronounce that himself? What is his preference? Uh, Do you know, I never asked him. I probably should have done. Uh, everyone's saying it's Mo. That makes oh. no sense to me. Um, I, I don't know. It, 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 some of the Danes that I was talking to, they call him Mao. How do you know? M O U, however you want to pronounce it. He had a good coming out party. I thought at the event, kind of made his yeah. statement. I think a uh, very effective play there. Hellraisers, what do you think? A decent field to get through, capturing the event. Oh yeah, I mean, look, this is a ridiculous uh, fairy tale story. There's uh, no no doubt about it. Uh, the um, Hell the Hellraisers victory was completely unexpected. I I thought once the, uh, um, Mouse Sports had beaten the E Frag, I thought they were shooing for the title. They looked so good. Uh, and uh, Hellraisers don't play a tactical game. It's as simple as that. They simply uh, try and move around the map and have duels and it, it, they're all about picks so when you're playing somewhat as tactical as mouse sports you think they're going to be able to shut it down but hell raises were just so on point there was absolutely nothing that mouse sports could do it was a great series i i, I told dennis uh you know i don't want best of sevens to become uh the, the norm not by a, a long chalk but what i will say is this definitely proved that it can work uh, we were quite fortunate in the sense that every map was close. It was back and forth. All the game, uh, each map was super engaging. Lots to talk about. Two contrasting styles, and it was a truly amazing series. Made all the better by the fact it was a best of seven. But uh, we're still, uh, you know, in in this territory where we're struggling to fit best of fives in a weekend. So uh, I don't see best of seven taking off, and nor do I think necessarily it should be. Uh, unless there's a very special set of circumstances surrounding it. But, you don't so, think we should see a best of seven group stage at ESL? Clone? <laughs> no, 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 but, no, but we'll start a best of three. It'd be nice, though, wouldn't it? It'd be better uh, than best but, of one. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I, I think just straight off the bat, you know, like mad, mad props to Hellraisers. They went there and they were very open, very vocal about if we don't finish top two at this event, we're going to probably disband or at the very least change the roster. They, they put themselves under tremendous pressure, and actually, most players would wilt under that uh, that kind of pressure, and they didn't. They 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 all rose to the occasion. They all elevated their game. That's the only way they were really capable uh, of winning. So I'm um, super happy for them. Disappointed for Mouse Sports, but I don't think it'll rock them too much. You've got to remember they're still on an upward trajectory. They're still looking an incredibly uh, good team, and of course. Mad credit to Efrag as well, who showed uh, by beating the likes of TSM that uh, they are now an, an elite European team as well, which is absolutely fantastic. So the scene is growing. We're getting more strength in depth. 
these tier two teams are now really showing that they can compete with the tier one teams. And it's a very exciting time for Counter-Strike. You mentioned Mouse Sports. Uh, Nex and Chris J both playing very well at this event. Um, these two guys look like stars as of late. Are they bona fide stars coming into their own now? Or is it a mirage perhaps for Chris J who's had some inconsistency issues in the past? Like, what's the, What do you think is the future for these two guys? Nex, pound for pound, is, is one of the best players in Europe. Certainly one of the most valuable players. Um, and, and to clarify, uh, the reason why those two things aren't indeed the same is someone being uh, valuable to their team is you know <laughs> subjective. How valuable you are isn't the same as how good you are. Right. Uh, but uh, next, both uh, an absolute incredible uh, star, just really solid. Seems to keep doing the impossible round after round, uh, dropping forty frags in some maps. And while I, I wouldn't say he put on a great, uh, you know, his highest level in the finals, he still had some moments like on Cash where he was absolutely insane. Yeah, he carried the game at that point. He yeah. Really now, Chris J, on the other hand, uh, is somebody that, you know, we've criticized him for being in, uh, inconsistent. But man, did he step it up here. I mean, it was just unbelievable. Like, this is the best I've ever seen Chris J play uh, with an AWP, with a rifle. He seemed to be good for like two kills every round. He was getting pistol kills. He made so many clutches. He went absolutely sick. And uh, as I said on, on stream at the time, if I ever make a joke about online J again, he's got full permission to punch me in the face. At least for the next few months, perhaps. There should be a limit, I think, to that. Like, no, that no, no, I, no, no. Forever, no, permanently. No, it's for, forever, permanently. Uh, okay, okay, he, uh, okay, I'll take that then. Yeah, uh, Absolutely. We mentioned the skills of Chris J and, uh, and Nex. Uh, God B, of course, a skilled tactician, um, does his thing for the team. Mouse Sports, you mentioned a very good tactical team, but he, I think, trailed by the, the top fragger for Mouse Sports in the final by about 50 frags. Is mm. it a problem at that point? Like, even if someone's a great tactician, when you have that big of a gap in terms of the frags, or does he do his job for them? No, I mean, he also had some incredibly uh, sick clutch rounds. I mean, you have to understand this isn't anything that Mouse Sports particularly did wrong. Uh, perhaps on Dust 2, they could have adapted to Hellraisers who only seemed to have one tactic, which was walk up short and get picks. Um, the, the, neither team seemed to call timeouts. I don't know if that was a mark of respect because Hellraisers were tired. That It did go the distance. There was a prospect that it could have ran until 1, 2, 3 in the morning. But, uh, uh, you know, Hellraisers, uh, sorry, Mouse Sports, while I'm disappointed about how they did against Hellraisers, ultimately this was just Hell Hellraisers playing on another level. The great thing about Counter-Strike is that you can, you can, you can outbrain each other, you can out-aim out each other, but ultimately if people get to a certain godlike level where they just don't miss, there's not really anything you can do. I mean, that's that. Once you attain that... that ridiculous level of consistency with their shots that hell raises were you know it's uh you're gonna have to go home it's just as simple as that and and accept that you were beaten by the better team on the day uh which mouse sports absolutely were there's there's no question about that um i saw i watched them after i left take tv's house uh to uh grab a few beers from the 24-hour kiosk around the corner as you do have a few celebratory drinks mm -hmm. with the uh with the talent uh that was there and uh, Mouse Sports were in a huddle outside of the house. Uh, Gobby was doing uh, a pep talk. All the coaches, all the, sorry, the coach was there. The manager was there. The movie maker was there. It was all the Mouse Sports family in their uh, trademark distinctive red and white jacket. Um, and I don't think this will rock them too much. Gobby said his aim was for the major in Cologne. Uh, I, I think it remains that way. And I think they're still a team to take very, very seriously indeed. You also mentioned Efrag. This is a team that's been on the rise for a while now, but it hasn't really had a standout result. Uh, they nearly put themselves in position to win this event, actually. They really made a good run for it. Kind of lost steam, I think, towards the end when they got up against it and had the real opportunity yeah. to go for the grand final. Um, do you think this is a team that could really prove themselves out in the long term? Is this a flash in the pan, or do you see them falling? I, I definitely don't think it's a flash in the pan either. I mean, the way they were playing... Uh, was so unorthodox compared to the other teams out there. They were making like double force buys work in a way that so many teams aren't able to. We saw Hellraisers get themselves into a pickle on more than one occasion by doing force buys that were completely ill-advised. Uh, and, and they actually made it harder for themselves at times over the course of the tournament. Uh, what EFRAG were doing, they were doing really illogical force buys. And uh, it... Um, it just seemed to work. It, they just made it work. And they made it work by sheer skill, individual skill. Now, again, what EFRAG 
uh, were doing really well that they weren't getting any props for and probably won't get any uh, props from apart from maybe me and a few players uh, was they were actually adapting. They would get six, seven rounds into a half. They would, if it wasn't working, they'd call a timeout and they would adapt to their opponents. Um, and they put in, I mean, the series uh, b- between them and Hellraisers was amazing. The series E Frag versus Mouse Sports was one of the best, best of threes I've ever seen uh, and been involved in for a long time. Um, so the, these are an incredible team, incredible talent. Dreamer is as good uh, as, as, as any of these sort of top. Uh, 30 players you know we know who all the top players are he's right up there uh with, with any of them he's he's really really sick and bubbles uh stepped up and looked great victor who was actually one of uh, one of the sort of more questionable performers when they had that great run at star ladder he really stepped it up as well they look great as a unit they've got lots of uh more events and more opportunities coming up for them including what should be a cakewalk in the form of the bulgarian eps finals uh, but yeah, that, I, I I don't think it's a flash in the pan at all. I'm really looking forward to seeing the evolution of this team. Um, their first result actually at this event was they went over TSM. Now, TSM, yeah. of course, the winners of the Face It League final, second the second season of that, looked very good there. Had good bounce back from their previous effort, which wasn't so hot for them at the uh, ESL ESA Pro League final. Here they came in. I think they took the first map from Efrag like 16 to four. They dominated. Looked like they were yeah. going to cruise through, and then they got taken back two games in a row. To lower bracket, lost to Hellraisers 2-0. Uh, how do you explain the result for TSM? They're kind of looking like an inconsistent team up and down right now. Is it a result of their lesser practice? What is it's it? Quite in- it's quite interesting, actually, because I, I, I obviously know that the TSM guys uh, very well, uh, like all of the Danish uh, dudes. And um, we, were, we were talking a little bit about it. Uh, you know, I, I hung out with uh, Carrigan very briefly, and, and we had a chat. And he said that he feels that the best thing that could happen to him before a major would be to get beaten uh, because he was like, even though they were going to try and win, he said it's really, really hard when people consider you the number one team in the world. Uh, I mean, and I I think a lot of people do. Uh, Obviously not ESL. I I imagine we'll get into that later. But um, the, uh, the, you know, there's, there's nobody, there's no demos to watch. You're winning all the time. So how do you watch and say, we need to do that to improve. You can't actually improve. When you're setting the bar, it's very hard in Counter-Strike, the way it works mechanically, to continue to raise the bar. You almost have to lose to, to, to be able to do that again, to sort of bounce back and overtake the level you were at previously. Mm. And that's what Carrigan believes. And I, I honestly think this bad performance here at uh, e, 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 uh, at uh, the uh, Ace Predator Masters, especially the E-Frag series, uh, is something that'll be perceived. I think it's a great gift for them, whether they whether their fans realize it or not. Uh, that's going to really help them going into the major. And plus, as well, after losing the first series, uh, you know they would have needed to win something like twelve maps to to even uh, like to win the tournament out or something. It would have just been a grueling attritional slog, which would have been that not what you need just before a major. So. I, I think lots about this tournament actually was really, really positive. Uh, even though they lost and finished seventh to eighth, I don't think that's a reflection of their level. I don't think anyone believes that for a second. Anyone can have a bad tournament, and this is the great thing about Counter Strike, especially when you're playing teams you don't typically play. You know, they they, they haven't played E Frag before, and they've, I'm sure they're going to learn great lessons when they get to sit down and watch those demos. And Carrigan's going to get new ideas. I can't wait to see how they assimilate them. Anybody that writes off TSM predicated on this tournament really doesn't understand the game or, or indeed uh, what it's like to be an in-game leader and, and, and a tactician. Also, the depth of the game today, just how many good teams there are. You mentioned EFRAG, a Tier 2 mm. team, proving themselves to be able to compete with anyone. I think it's going to become a more common thing now. We're going to see more of that. Just that like we've seen North American teams have more success. We're going to see more uh, secondary European teams have more success, I think, in the future. As we move on, you mentioned the attrition for uh, TSM if they had won the event. Hellraisers, who did win the event from the same position TSM were in, had to win 12 maps and played 17 games in the yep. lower bracket alone. That doesn't count their loss in the upper bracket. I think if you counted that, it would be uh, 19 games played, 12 yep. won for Hellraisers. That is an insane run. They, they, this is what I mean. They, 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 what, they, what they did is is incredible. Uh, they're great professionals. 
Uh, they're super nice guys. I mean, like they may seem a little inaccessible to the uh, average Counter Strike fan. Uh, I know they've got a lot of support in the regions, but because of language barriers, I think maybe some people have trouble warming to them. Uh, for example, there was some upset about Kusha doing the the double V for victory uh, as they were uh, sort of winning rounds. Uh, one of the great things actually. Uh, about the the tournament as a whole was they set up the playing area like an old school LAN final where you sat facing each other, ah. you know, in rows and you could stand up and shout at each other and psych each other out. And no, not one professional player complained about that. In fact, they all embraced it. They all loved it. It's one of the sad things about soundproof booths. This is why I've never been 100% sold on soundproof booze. I, I think, sure, we need competitive integrity. We need to ensure there's no cheating or jiggery pokery going on. But equally, we lose a massive part of esports, which is the psychological side. And uh, if there's room for sledging in cricket, I think there's room for trash talk in a, in a sport like Counter-Strike. But anyway, um, I, I, I think the, the run that they've gone on is, is absolutely insane. Uh, at this event, it's uh, one of those great stories that I, I hope people remember and continually come back to, even if it wasn't the biggest tournament. And I hope it gives Hellraiser's confidence to move forward and go out into the scene. And and okay, now we know what we're capable of. It's going to give them a newfound belief, and they're going to be able to uh, do serious damage to other teams when they come across them. Hopefully, they show this form again, the form that allows them to win 12 games out of 19 and play, which is just Again, an insanely grueling thing to go for. You also mentioned soundproof booths. Uh, the problem with those is they often don't work as they currently exist. So why have a soundproof well, booth if you're not going to have it be functional? It's it's incredibly hard to get a, a soundproof uh, soundproof booth uh, to, to work. I mean, just because of physics and you know how how, how sound works and everything else. So uh, I mean, the you know we're, we're we're really aspiring for something that is, you know, almost unobtainable. Uh, but um, the ones that we've got, that you know, are the ones that I stand in when I go to Gfinity. They definitely uh, the work uh, well enough, combined with the the headsets and everything. But uh, but I still miss the days of having teams be able to see each other and and trash talk and try and get inside each other's heads. That was always an integral part of Counter Strike when I was growing up with it. Uh, that was what we used to do when I, even back when I was a player. That was how we used to do things. Um, and I, I I think the scene is. Uh, a worse place for not still having that there. Yeah, things have changed. Nowadays, you cheat by bringing in a USB stick full of your, your uh, software. Back in the day, you cheated by typing in message mode 2 and then deleting it to ghost illegally. That was the old school way of doing things. Ian, I notice as you uh, interact with our loyal audience here, Indeed. You, you've had uh, some dog pictures. Uh, can you explain what's going on? We're, uh, the conversation took an, inter an interesting turn. Mm -hmm. uh, we began by talking about Australian shepherds, and somehow that came down to me enslaving the people of Australia. And okay. so I corrected them quickly with a picture of an Australian So you're basically uh, the UK in this in this case. Uh, precisely. Yes. Okay. Yeah, just making that, sure. Uh, that's is it too soon for jokes like that? No, it's is that fine. Joke? Okay. It's fine. That's it's fine. Been that's, that's hundreds good. of years. It's been enough. We're right. good with that joke. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Richard ESL Cologne, the major that that uh, Kerrigan's gunning for, that EFRAG would like to be playing that well at a major like that. Won't get the chance this time, I don't think. Uh, Mouseport's gunning for it with Got B. Uh, it's coming up. The field is set, in fact. I'm going to read off the teams here. Uh, Fnatic, okay. Nip, Virtus Pro Envy, Mouse Sports Luminosity, the new Brazilian Luminosity, mind you, TSM, Navi, Renegades, Immunity, Kingwin, Ebetzel, Cloud9, CLG, Flipside, Titan. No Hellraisers, no EFRAG. Very sad. There's Ebetzel instead of EFRAG for whatever that's yeah. it, it, it is. It, it is sad, but uh, ultimately, I mean, I, I saw a lot of people uh, complaining about the best of one format, which you know everybody knows my thoughts about it. It isn't ideal. Uh, it has arguably led to some teams not being there. Uh, sorry, being there that that maybe wouldn't have been there if we were doing best of threes. But what we got to remember, of course, is that uh, these um, th this is very good for them. The stick of money uh, alone can be enough to elevate uh, an organization uh, from a state of whether you know being a chance organization where they pick up a team and it's just fingers crossed maybe we can do something with it to actually being self-sustaining and being able to put some resources into it and get to more tournaments so this is this is how small organizations grow and that's what we really need in counter-strike right now uh is the depth and breadth 
of teams and organizations capable of supporting teams, not uh, a few elite teams that get to go to every major tournament and consolidate the wealth at the top. Uh, that would that would not help Counter Strike at all. So I, I'm glad actually that we get to see some of the lesser teams there, especially E Battle. Uh, you, you know, I mean, it's uh, it, I don't know how well they'll do in the tournament. Uh, I, I'm going to be very intrigued to see how Hyper performs. But uh, at the end of the day, I, I'm glad there are teams that are going to get there. And, and sure, if we have to miss out on one or two of the big boys, it's not like there isn't going to be another major. Counter-Strike's not going anywhere. I, I honestly think with the growth it's got in 18 months, it'll probably be uh, the biggest eSport. Yeah, the field as it is is completely stacked. I mean, you have some great storylines here. You have the new Envy and Titan coming in. You have Virtus Pro coming off of a win. Mouse Sports were there upward uh momentum cloud nine upper momentum king one even looking better and of course fanatic tsm a really good lineup navi i didn't mention them they I think are our potential favorite not maybe not the favorite for the tournament but a big uh a big contender navi are in my mind for the the whole of title so i'm excited for it uh, well but put it this way i mean look there's so many stories going on you've got tsm are they in a slump aren't they was it were they saving things? Were they trying to make themselves look weak before a major? There's all these sort of weird theory crafting things going on. We got the new look, Envious and Titan. Imagine if those guys met at any point that mattered in 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 the major. You've got uh, you've got um, obviously the, these underdogs like E Battle. You know, I would say Flipside without Simple as well. Who they put an interview out uh, recently saying we're glad Simple's gone. Like it's much better for us now. You've got Mouse Sports, the home team uh, that that have been on this upward trajectory. You, I mean, it's just you know you've got Fnatic, you've got NIP, who of course have this ridiculous record in in majors. Like literally, there are so many storylines going into this tournament yeah uh, and uh it, it's gonna be it's gonna be a classic i mean you know again as i as i revealed earlier i, I got invited to be the host uh, I, I i sort of declined politely uh, on some you know uh reasons of principle and uh i'm i'm, I'm obviously internally devastated uh, not to be involved with that because this is going to be an amazing high point for counter-strike uh, and, and the continued evolution and growth of CSGO. August 20, save the date. That's the when the tournament starts, and it'll be a good one. You mentioned uh, ESM and their struggles, mm. Richard. The ESL Invitational is coming to us live from Dubai, and of the six teams invited, TSM was not included, which is a bit of an odd decision, it would seem, because TSM has been, for some time now, considered one of the two best teams in the world, along with Fnatic, perhaps by some the best team in the world, prior to their recent uh, slump? Can you really call it a slump, considering they won the Face It League final? You know, whatever you want to call it. Here they are. Um, apparently, the top five ranked teams in Europe from, by, ES, uh, by ESL and the top one in North America were invited, and that means TSM misses the cut under, for example, NIP, who I don't think their achievements quite compare to TSM's over the past several months. But because, again, the way the points did, because the way the rankings were set up, uh, NIP gets in over TSM. Tough pill to swallow for TSM, certainly. Uh, what do you think about this decision, the way the rankings work? We have TSM players whose achievements in the past have been credited to Dignitas because of the way it works. Just kind of a, a weird system for me. Uh, I mean, look, uh, first of all, any uh, system uh, is going to come under criticism. There's no doubt about it. I remember back, way, way, way back, uh, when we, um, we we had a, a, at a small website where I, where I started writing about uh, Counter-Strike. Uh, called Source Junkie, we uh, had a mathematical system that was devised by the captain of the best UK team at the time, uh, the Z Board, uh, which I went on to manage. And he came up with this like equation, and we ran teams through it, and we did waiting for every tournament. So you didn't get the same amount of points for winning tournaments. It was based on prestige and the types that went in there it was actually quite a complicated system now we were like well nobody can argue with any top 10 ranking based on this because it's mathematical but in a lot of ways actually the problem with mathematical systems is that if the if the equation itself is wrong if the theory behind the maths is wrong the answer will always be wrong the answer will always be gibberish right and and, and patently so and this is the problem you have got with this ESL ranking system the equation is wrong. The formula is wrong. It makes no sense. There isn't a single person in the world that would rank TSM as the sixth best team in the world. There isn't a single person in the world right now that would rank NIP above them 
and certainly the new untested envious above them uh even predicated on when they had that run as ldlc and and all the great things they did they there's the, the comparison with tsm who've won four of the last six tournaments they attended uh is uh, is nonsense there is no comparison um, really yes there, there, there simply isn't uh and uh, you know for, for clg to be as high as ninth i mean it, it it really strikes me as as a deeply flawed system, uh, which I I think is uh, obvious for everybody to see. Now, again, if it's if it's a system that you're doing because you want to publish content and you just want people to come to your website and look at it, then you can't really lose with a top ten because a top ten will always my top ten will differ from yours. It'll differ from Ian's and probably is everyone in the Twitch chat right now. Right. But even if you have a mathematical system and you're like, hey, guys, this is a completely solid and logical mathematical system, people still disagree with it. And that disagreement generates traffic and, every, and that traffic is the, the end goal uh, for content. You have a real problem when you take a top 10 as deeply flawed as that and you use it to select who goes to your event. Uh, it's, that, it's, it's appalling that TSM uh, haven't been invited over other teams. I can only speculate that maybe there was something else going on because before this was released, uh, well, I was still at an event with TSM when they found out. They came up to me and they were like, have you seen this? And I was like, what? And I was like, yeah. And they were like, we haven't been invited. I was like, that seems a bit weird. I was like, you guys sure you haven't been approached? We spoke to your managers. Like, yeah, nobody even knew this was coming. We had no idea. So uh, I, by the time I landed and, and you know, and, and the brief time I spent in the airport before takeoff, I got to look at it. And, of course, this top 10 had been revealed as the rationale behind it. And that only makes it worse. <laughs> that actually makes it worse. <laughs> if ESL had come out and said, well, look, Denmark doesn't have a very big, uh, you know, fan base. And we really need to sell the Dubai thing with as many viewers as possible. You know, just something, some other rationale. Of course, like it's hard to say that when you have the TSM name. It's hard to yeah, say that. Yeah. Which, which was the point I would have made anyway. Right. Uh, but, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm at a loss, really, to explain it. Uh, now, the good news is I obtained uh, the email uh, for the chap who did the ranking and did the system. And um, I've already written a lengthy screed to, to send his way, as I promised my Danish colleagues I would. But um, it already looks like ESL realize that this is uh, going to blow up. And I've certainly voiced my opinion to all the ESL employees that I know. I'm like, guys, you need to fix this. Uh, because even if it looks like you're going to kowtow to the community, you have kind of made a mistake here. Um, so they've already tweeted out that they're, hey, guys, should we extend it to eight teams? Yeah. Yeah. Of Let us know, you fans. You decide. Help us. Like it's a PR yeah, thing. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 we'll do yeah. what you want to do, fans. Right. Yeah, exactly. And that's the only way you can spin it right now. Yeah. Because prior to that, there was only two answers, really, for ESL doing this. Either it was they genuinely believed TSM didn't deserve to be invited, which is incompetent. Ludicrous, right? Yeah. Or you are doing it for malicious reasons. Uh, and therefore, that's very unprofessional. So there, it, it would have been lose lose, whichever one it is. So I, I'm 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 fairly confident they'll turn that around, and TSM will get to go to Dubai, which is what we all want in the Counter Strike community. It's actually very be more beneficial for ESL, and uh, it's uh, you know it's what all the players should want as well. In fact, I had I haven't seen one pro player who was like, yeah, I, even players who were going to be there at the tournament that might well are likely to get beaten by TSM and saying TSM should be there. That tells you all you need to know about it. Well, then we've got some people in chat actually wondering uh, specifically what is there to be gained from ESL Dubai? Obviously, it's important if you're a strong team to participate in as many majors, <laughs> non-majors as you like. But is this the sort of event that's going to draw a crowd or further, or even further legitimize uh, TSM's run as a top flight team in Counter-Strike? Is it, is it worth it, I guess, is the real question for TSM to protest and fly themselves out to the sweatiest place on earth? Um... I mean, I, I definitely think so. Uh, the the Dubai market is one of those emerging markets. We all know in esports how much we like emerging markets. Oh yeah, um, that's what we're all about, right? Because uh, you know the the reality is uh, we still haven't utilized fully the uh, awesome profit potential of North America, and we're getting there. Um, so now it's time to start thinking about other regions. Dubai has almost been 
a or, you know it's been on a list for a long period of time of events that we want to crack. It was talked about during the CGS era. I'm pretty sure um, some of the uh, CGS executives, some of the more shadowy ones, uh, went to Dubai to have talks about an esports event. It's never really seemed to happen, but given there's a very distinct reason why people want to crack the Dubai market, and that's because any Emirati nation has literally more money than cents. And if they're going to make something like Ferrari World, which is owned by uh, a sheikh, uh, the way you can drive gold-plated Ferraris around a racetrack if you can afford it and other such nonsense, if we're going to exist in a, in a country that has so much money it can afford to build a replica of an island seven times over going out into the sea just because... Um, then obviously when esports comes along and they're like, you know, we might need a million for this. And of course, some rich Emirati is going to be, please, my friends, take two million. Uh, that was like the count from Sesame Street there. But you get my point. They, they, that's why they want to crack Take two million. Very good. Three million. The point is, wherever there is this disposable income, wherever the big marketing budgets are, that's where the esports shills, the esports businesses are going to be. So you're definitely going to see a big push on Dubai. And as I said, it'll be South America as well. I also saw uh, Trig Esports, if you recall them, Richard, we're going to go to Dubai and have a big Formula One-like circuit there for esports. I'm, yeah, I'm shocked all... we haven't seen that yet, actually. No, I, I, I think they're just doing all they can to stay out of fucking prison at the moment, to be honest. Uh... So um, maybe we'll see a Trig event uh, put on from their cells. Jared, I get Who the knows? feeling you're not actually shocked by that. I'm not I actually just, surprised. Just, my spidey sense is tingling. I don't think you're actually surprised. The Trig Esports, the people who promised us a uh, an esports reality show, if I'm not mistaken, they did uh, have not ponied up on all their promises. Yeah, it didn't really go so well, yeah, honestly. So I think we'll see the uh, the five million dollar uh, Kickstarter event from last <laughs> week funded before we see Trig have a Formula One series of esports in Dubai. Yeah. But you know, perhaps both will happen. It could happen. Mm, you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned Richard, the uh, potential for the American market. I saw uh, Liquid and CLG playing a qualifier semifinal, not even Cloud9 involved, get over 120,000 viewers. That just kind of shows you there's still space to grow in, in this region for uh, in terms of marketing it. That's why we yeah. made such a big deal about these teams. And it, it makes me sick because um, we're, we're seeing California become uh, the new mecca for esports and all these uh, rich and powerful... Uh, cabals and, and 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 groups that uh, are you know that drive esports and now all going to centralize and be out there. So um, actually, the Europeans, which have done pretty much everything uh, for esports since uh, CPL, really, uh, it, it's been it's been the Europeans that have really driven it and grown it, and a lot of regions that perhaps don't get as much love back. Um, it, and it, it that's not going to be what's happening in the future that's not going to be the driving force it's going to be california and uh, hey everyone we're we're all going to act like creepy cults out with our tech startups and all of that it's actually you know it, I, there's a very depressing future uh, if you look at the corporations that are coming in you know even corporatism uh, probably is going to define the future of esports we've already seen attitudes wise that certain things are deemed unacceptable by the small uh, you know the the uh, young the demographic i should say uh you know for example i, I saw red eye getting chewed up about some light-hearted banter on the international um it obviously happens all the time in league it's starting to happen in counter-strike because we get that spillover so in the future basically you're going to have amazon or google sponsored children's tv broadcasts for esports all of which are coming out of america with american sensibilities and the rest of the world be damned uh, and and that, that's literally where we're headed in about the next two years for esports. I certainly don't want a part of that. Um, and I hope anyone that helped build esports and actually had a hope for esports wouldn't want to be part of that either. In fairness to the Dota 2 community, you're looking at a community that currently has an incredible tournament with an incredible cast of characters that's extremely well done. They're, they're pretty much just searching for drama at this point. Yeah, well, I mean, all communities do. And unfortunately... Um, you know, I, I, I think it, it does stem from this idea that, and it's, it's quite upsetting, isn't it, that we're letting a bunch of uh, teenagers, a mob of teenagers effectively, dictate what the terms of professionalism 
are for people that built esports and basically made it to possible for them to engage with this thing they profess to care about so much. So much they tear down everyone that says anything they don't like and the companies allow them to do so. So, uh, yeah, like I say, it's not a it's not a particularly pleasant uh, environment right now for anyone that's serious about esports. I'm already noticing the change. And as I said, I'm not enjoying it one little bit. And uh, I doubt I doubt a lot of uh, esports veterans are. There is some money, I guess. There's that. There's always always some money. I have to say, Richard, as you talk about California, you are representing California's worst export right now with uh, your yes. Raiders jersey. So. To be fair, that, if any, if anything, I, I feel that makes me more qualified. Okay, to just talk about the ills of uh, California. I just want to say, to be fair, you are uh, showing off the worst California has to offer yourself as you bemoan uh, California. <laughs> all, all the all the more depressing. <laughs> this is actually a, a McFadden jersey. So, oh my Ooh. god, are your legs feeling okay, Ooh. Richard? Your knees like they hold up, pretty, and you're just in your seat there. Are you fine? Yeah, it's pretty grim, isn't it? Okay, it is kind of grim. I'm, Speaking of, I'm, I must get a new one. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Please, please do. Please do from the NFL shop. dot com. Um, speaking of grim things, how about faking being swatted on Twitch? Yeah. How about that? Uh, yeah. So, trick two G. Um, yeah. The the trick two G incident. I uh, you know again I, I I caught this just as I was coming out uh, of of the event, and I I I saw it uh, on the night that it happened. We were struggling to get internet out in in Crayfeld. It's not exactly a uh, how shall we put it, uh, you know, hotbed of 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 broadband and internet related activity. There's not going to be ever any uh, you know land cafes or anything there. Uh, but um, apart from take TVs, of course. Um, so we we were struggling to get internet in the hotels and stuff. And I saw it. I saw the incident. I watched the incident. It was clearly clearly a fake SWAT. I watched the video, and I was like, look, first of all, the dude is smiling. Second of all, they're not wearing, uh, the people that are arresting him aren't wearing uh, SWAT attire, which, again, is, I mean, I'd like to think people could recognize what a SWAT police officer looks like. Which it stands for Special Weapons and Tactics. Now, you're not just going to come in in a fucking T-shirt. Uh, so there's that. It depends um, on their budget, to be fair. It depends on their budget, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure those budgets are being rapidly in increased if the atrocities in Ferguson and everything else or anything. You have to, to build by. that new Raider Stadium, actually. You can't um, you know, <laughs> you have budget for uh, police gear. But uh, but anyway, uh, so it was it was clearly a fake SWAT. There's precedent before uh, of streamers making light of the ge genuinely awful practice of SWATing. I've written about SWATing extensively. I've done a number of articles. I even had an article published in uh, our uh, sister publication, The Colonel, uh, about about swatting and, and the history of it. It's uh, it, it certainly is horrible when it happens to people. Uh, it's not. It's especially in, in in America where the police are trigger happy, and uh, we see this horrendous increase in police brutality and the number of people murdered by police every year, uh, which is rising year upon year in America. It's somebody is going to die if somebody doesn't. It's, that will happen. Okay. However, that said, this is not a swatting action. This was clearly a fake swatting action. This was a lighthearted bit of fun at the end of a 24-hour charity stream. And I don't think it's right for Twitch to start stifling the creativity of the artists that have basically made Twitch such a huge success and profitable company that everyone involved with it is now sat on piles of Amazon money. I think it's absolutely disgraceful to ban somebody who has been one of the cornerstones of that success, a uh, a, a, a huge, you know, a, a huge talent, somebody that really stood out for me from the first moment I saw him as being something different. Trick 2G is everything that is good about Twitch. And I think once Twitch starts stifling creativity and using very vague interpretations of their own rules to do so, um, I, I think you're getting into awful territory. And I don't like it when Twitch does all this moralizing, uh, for example, about what you can wear and whatnot. I think, yes, we need, obviously, clear defined rules. If you're showing 
over 18 content on a stream that is for under 18s, for example, yes, Twitch should absolutely step in. I think stifling comedic creativity for, from their entertainers is a travesty. And uh, I certainly hope they revise this. We saw that uh, on the League of Legends subreddit, the comments now deleted. Somebody who uh, called called Hassan Chop, who uh, that's a Bugs Bunny reference, which of course I appreciate immensely. He said that uh, the the ban wasn't four months; that it was a ridiculous number that had been plucked from thin air. Uh, but that comment has now been deleted, which suggests one of two things: either that is a lie, or he has overstepped his jurisdiction and shouldn't be talking about it. Uh, quite clearly, the ban is going to be lengthy. Um, it, 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 I've even heard rumors already uh, on the phone as I was in the cab coming to my house that there's a possibility that he may have his uh, sub on, on his return. Trick2G might have his sub button taken away from him is another rumor that is going around. And I just feel there is absolutely nothing in that that is, is, is worth uh, this sort of hysteria or... Or punishment, unless somebody could demonstrate that some genuine harm had come from it. Somebody said to me, actually, and this gives you a level of the lack of critical thinking in the esports community. Someone said to me, "It's a fake. If you fake a SWAT, you're wasting police time." I want you to think about that for a moment. I am thinking about Richard right now. Yes. Yeah. Doesn't that doesn't that blow your mind? That's what could be so fucking stupid. It's very esports, actually. <laughs> mm. So, yes, I, uh, I I certainly hope Twitch uh, see the error of their ways and resolve this. I, I imagine the first thing I'll be doing tomorrow, uh, while having a nice cup of black coffee, uh, will be writing an editorial that basically says we need to free Trick Two G. This is a very dangerous road for Twitch to be going down, and I'm not going to draw any conclusions about Nick Allen joining them. Uh, and all of a sudden they now decide that they want to go down a path of discipline for their talent because I don't really think that, that that's down to Nick Allen. I think people are reaching if they, they, if they do that. But this is not an acceptable way to treat one of their premier talents. Uh, you know, this was a, uh, at best, this was a error of judgment in a, create, in a creative decision. If you don't give your broadcasting talent the room to breathe and make these mistakes you're going to end up with an incredibly stale product. And if all the streamers that want to do something different or try something different or try and be edgy and try and cater to a niche audience, if you're going to ban them every time they fuck up and do something you don't like, they're all going to go to YouTube and Twitch is going to be a barren wasteland. So they See, need I'm to glad think you brought up YouTube. I, I think there's, there's a very natural question that needs to be asked because this Trick2G incident, uh, certainly not by design, it was Trick2G's decision, uh, but the choice to ban Trick2G comes after, uh, just a couple of weeks after they decided to ban uh, Hatred, the, the video game. It seems like there's sort of uh, a concerted push. Is this, is, do you see any patterns in these actions perhaps uh, on the business level? Or are they just worried about whether or not they can compete with YouTube gaming and so they're trying to keep their, their platform squeaky clean? Or is there something else going on in this, uh, this pattern of decisions that's, that's not just very severe but seems very specifically targeted at uh, mature and controversial uh, content A pattern of censorship is what yeah, it is. Yeah, certainly, certainly, pattern of censorship. Well, I mean, I, I think if you go down that road um, and, and, and we start linking uh, censorship on, on, on Twitch to this, um, I think we, you know, I, I would ask the question, why was somebody like Crow, uh, who announced his retirement recently? Uh, now, uh, Crow uh, did a, uh, that's CR0 underscore, uh, for those that haven't had the dubious pleasure of seeing the shit that he pumped out through Twitch for two years. Uh, Crow was somebody who, for me, demonstrated genuine signs of uh, being ill, uh, quite quite unwell. Uh, he, he basically used to do some of the most ridiculous things I've ever seen. I, I, I think he shit himself on stream once uh, for comedic effect. Uh, he certainly looked to be taking drugs. He'd done uh, CSGO box openings with people that he was referring to as his lady friends, but... I think it was a bit of a badly kept secret that they may have been prostitutes um, that he'd hired for the purposes of sitting on the room for a twi Twitch broadcast. Now, this is an individual 
that was faking drug use, was being very uh, over the top, um, and used to do things that were I, I certainly wouldn't consider suitable uh, for anyone to see, but each to their own. That was his shtick. He did have a fan base. Um, and I didn't see it, Twitch stepping in it, it, until uh, right towards the end and, and doing anything about that. And I believe that was related to a uh, a cheating incident where he was quite openly cheating in Counter Strike, uh, uh, you, you know, using third party software. So on stream. So he's now deleted all the videos and all evidence and claimed that it was all an act, that he was just an actor um, and he was all playing a part. Yet in his video where he departs from the scene, he still sounds like the unintelligible idiot that he always was on his stream. So um, perhaps playing the part a little bit too well. The highest I, form, I, form of art, Richard. Yeah, so I would, I, 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 I would ask, you know, why why is he allowed? Why 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 is it there? I mean, you know, we, we, we've got people like Christy Plays. She's one of my favorite streamers. I, I love uh, to tweet out when Christy Plays goes live. Um, and is playing League of Legends. Um, you know, she is an example, I think, of how you push the boundaries at Twitch. This is a, a woman who has, uh, you know, starred in some adult videos. Again, I have no problem with that. I will never judge anyone on that. I think if you're doing that, um, you're, uh, you're an idiot, uh, frankly. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a business like any other. It's, it's legal. It's, uh, if you're an adult, you make those decisions. But she would sp quite specifically set up her stream to not be about the game. In fact, her huge uh, pendulous breasts, or, or which were, I mean, I'm not even sure of the size. I don't know what, I mean, double Fs, triple Fs, I, I don't even know. I mean, just mammoth, colossal uh, boobs that have been deliberately, you know, artificially uh, created to be this way. And then you'd have this tiny little screen of the game she was playing on. Now... At that point, that's where my friends reach out to me and they go, is this Twitch or is this live Jasmine? And, I, and I'm, I'm sure all the adults in the audience know exactly what I'm talking about there. Now Twitch haven't done anything about that, and I don't think they should. And just recently, just the other day, I saw uh, YouPorn tweet it out, I think it was. Uh, we, we want to get some of our uh, adult actors to, to stream on Twitch. Who would you like to see? And I didn't see an official response from Twitch saying that this wasn't going to be allowed. So, like, like everything, when you enter into the murky water of censorship, you have to be either tediously consistent or you have to admit that maybe it's not your place, not your decision to censor or you get into the ridiculous territory of, like, the BBFC and people like that. And I think that's what's happening here from Twitch. They're picking and choosing their morals very loosely with no consistency. And it, 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 this isn't about whether, whether something or not is adult entertainment or not. You know, they made the decision on hatred predicated on media outrage. They didn't want to be associated with any headlines that were likely to come if there was a school shooting and the person who had perpetrated it had ever played hatred. They didn't want to be associated with that future headline. And of course, even though there's still, to this day, no evidence that ever connects a school shooting to a computer game, uh, people are starting to distance themselves. People are starting to almost lend credibility to that myth. Um, so that's why that decision was taken, and any other claim is a lie and is ludicrous. And we all need to be intelligent enough to see through the bullshit. This, I, I, I have no idea why this has happened. I have no idea where this has gone so far. And I certainly hope Twitch uh, remedy the situation. I hope this is almost like a temporary ban while they try and think about what sort of precedent they want to set. You know, it, that would seem to lend some credibility to that, that the, uh, the post that was deleted on Reddit, as, as you mentioned. It, I think the big problem here is whatever you think about fake swatting or, or any of these things, selective censorship is, is pretty bad. Censorship, censorship itself is bad. Selective censorship even worse. So hopefully we'll get, see, get to see some consistency at the very least and a thorough and easily to understand ruling from Twitch, I hope. Mm. We'll see that. We'll, we'll find out. One more topic for you, Richard. Um, another yes. dumb thing that happened, actually. Uh, Riot removed a champion, Gangplank, from the game. Not that anyone plays Gangplank, but, you know, just follow me here. Uh, they removed him from the game for lore reasons because mm. he was... He was murdered temporarily by misfortune. Another champion no one cares about or plays. Uh, 
odd decision. And then he was he was made available in competitive play while he wasn't available in the main game. So you have kind of a doubly confounding thing where, again, you have a, a champion or move from, the, from a, an esports game, a competitive game, like League of Legends exists to be played competitively, obviously, for a lore reason, a story-based reason. And then you have that champion being made available if you're playing competitively in the official Riot uh, subjugation, not otherwise. Both yeah. very strange things for me. Are you surprised? I mean, how, how, do you even, how does one react to this? I think we're getting to a stage now where we can we can actually start to see that the emperor has uh, no clothes here with with riot. Uh, they they have failed to deliver fundamental things that they have promised on multiple occasions, such as replays. They have failed to deliver uh, a, a, a smarter and better and easier to use client, despite home. But you know, bedroom coders proving that they can do it, like the Wintermint client, which came out, and Riot's response was to hire the individual responsible for that, and then simply use any of their work uh, at all. Um, so, the things that people want, you know, they, we, we, we're not going to get them. Riot can't deliver them for whatever reason. Uh, it could be incompetence, it could be laziness, it could be uh, a different business focus. Could be all part of some great master plan because we all know they like to assess psychologically how we all react to the things they do for their little studies that light later than quotes. But uh, what's clearly happened here is uh, this was an experiment. They really wanted to try and do something for the law of the game. Uh, they hired uh, Graham McNeil. Um, who Warhammer fans uh, and, and, and Games Workshop fans will know. Uh, he published 28 novels in the uh, Black Library, which is the books that Games Workshop uh, put out, uh, including a lot of uh, Warhammer 40,000 uh, work. And he that was quite a significant hire. He's not being paid peanuts to be there. Now, that chap may or may not have had something to do with this, but you can see that what Riot want to do is add this like rich law to the game. Lots of people have been crying about it on Reddit, so Riot are trying to do something. But this was, it just shows the limitation of what they can do. They couldn't do anything cool in the game, so they disabled the champion and were like, tee hee 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 hee. <laughs> right? Aren't we, aren't we funny? Perhaps I'm we're sure just waiting we... on the release of DJ Gangplank. Is that yeah, possible? yeah. Uh, yeah. Probably, I mean, probably what's going to happen. Very good. Yes. The 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 uh, you know you know the hilarity of, of this uh, is of course, and I'm sure internally they all thought this was a really good idea, and of course it's a really stupid idea. It's a, so it's frankly a terrible way to launch a champion. I think. Yeah, just um, scheming and planning and thinking what a great surprise it'll be when we actually deactivate a hero because he got killed in in the story. That's so cool, and and then you do it, and it's like oh god. What? He has a robot so, arm now, so there's that, I guess. Yeah, and exactly. And, and and now, to try and sort of justify it, I mean, it's kind of like the Scion rework, uh, I, I guess. It's comparable to that, although it is more absurd. What they do is they take a fundamental uh, archetype uh, and they have this event, which is actually a non-event. Let's, let's be real here. They changed the in-game music. They did, like, a video... And then they disabled the champion. I mean, this is not a fucking event at all. This is actually, you, you know, uh, I would imagine that even Riot could have put this together in quite a quite a short space of time. And now you change the fundamental design of the uh, character. Yeah, he was going to be subject to a rework anyway. You change the look of him, predicated on this event that happened. And ultimately, as you as you pointed out, these were two characters that were marginalized. I, I don't know. I don't know what they're thinking here. Really, it it just seems so badly executed. Um, and if, as I said, I I'm really starting to worry now. You know, based on this, based on the Ask FM answers from Ghost Crawler and Riot Light, I honestly think they're stuck with a lemon. I, that's genuinely what I think. I think they've got this game, and I think they simply cannot actually update the code in a meaningful way. So they're just going to bombard us with bullshit like this, which is second rate and, and ultimately doesn't really appease any of the fans. You know? So that's, that's my take on it. 
it is the age-old question of what Riot does after League of Legends. Perhaps they just extend League forever. There's mm. no escape. There's always League of Legends. There's always Riot Games. Your internal overlords in esports watching over you, suspending you as it is appropriate. And the final game code will be, of course, 100 gigabytes uh, of just <laughs> repetitive dead code and uh, bugs and uh, 300 forever champions. and ever. Amen. Yeah. 300 champions, 15 or so in the meta. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds precisely. Good to me. Yep. Only yeah. five or 10 get picked or banned at any given time. You know, I, I look, I know it's not. Um, I I know it's not the same department. I'm not stupid, but um, I, I I gotta say uh, that it does it does really point to the priorities of the company. And Riot Light gave this great answer. I mean, this was so typically Jeffrey Lynn. It was uh, you know Riot Riot Light. It was so so uh, in- incredible. Uh, he said, just because something comes first doesn't mean it's our first priority. Mm. Right, which which I guess technically can be true. But let's just say, for example, if a new client is your fucking first priority and it's taking you like five years or whatever, you know, it's like, okay, probably you might want to revise how you're allocating resources within the company. Right. This this year alone, they've released over 57 skins. Uh, that's not even before we get into new champions released, reworks of champions and chroma skins. And yet we've still got fundamental bugs uh that can't be fixed we still have no replay system uh the, the the game seems to become more tedious and drawn out with every patch and i honestly believe that even a community is bigger league of legends i think the core fan base the hardcore fan are really starting to lose patience with the direction riot are taking uh especially the esports fans who are getting you know having to be doubly frustrated by watching them not just how they're handling the game but also ha- how they're handling the professional league so Riot have gone from being in this enviable position to now where it's, it is getting frank, frankly embarrassing uh, the way they're handling their business and the things they're publicly saying for anyone with a little bit of critical intelligence. I think my favorite comment about Riot's priorities is actually uh, from Sky Williams who said, uh, we know that y'all want a, a better game client. We know that you guys want a replay system. So here you go, Chroma Skins. And yeah. it's a, that does seem to be, whereas, uh, you know, for example, not to compare an apple to an orange, but, but Dota 2 had serious po- problems with uh, networking, with uh, performance, with visual bugs, with in-game bugs, and they were sort of squashing them as soon as they could. But at a certain point, Valve said, okay, we're moving on to Source 2. Let's improve performance for low-end machines. Let's improve how our network is handling the traffic. And that's an overhaul that just if you listen to uh, try to read the writing on the wall, for example, with what Riot is telling the public and what their development priorities seems to be, it doesn't seem like that sort of update is actually maybe ever going to happen. Are we ever going to see, uh, for example, a League of Legends 2, which they've, if, if I'm not mistaken, they've said in the past isn't going to yeah. happen. But and, they've said absolutely there will never be a sequel to League and, of Legends. And that leaves, once again, as you've, as you've said, that just leaves League of Legends in a very difficult position uh, moving forward, I think. But hey, more, por- more uh, pool party skins. Oh, thank God. Oh, by yeah. the way, Rex is on a jet ski now. Yeah. So Yeah, you we see got that, that right. Well, well, there, there we are then. Yeah, there, yeah. Uh, so we, we really we've made it. I I I, I take it back. Right. I'm glad <laughs> you do because you should. After having seen Rex Sai on jet ski, that's uh. He by the way he bugs sometimes. Just to throw that in there. Oh good. Oh discussion. thank yeah. God. Well he doesn't always get in the jet ski. Wouldn't be a League of Legends skin without. Yeah, I mean, have they even fixed Paul's fire Ezreal yet? <laughs> Is that, did that ever get fixed? Ah, uh, you know. <laughs> serious question. Details, Richard. Hey, they have priorities, and you know what? That may not be the first one. Okay, the yeah, first true. one is, is some chroma skins. Uh, as true. always, big thanks to Richard Lewis for joining us on the loadout. If you like what you've seen on the show here, please follow the channel. But we're not done yet. We'll be right back after this video break to talk to the manager of Renegades, continuing our league discussion with the uh, Challenger Series playoffs coming up this very week. Exciting. So stick around for that. Thanks again to Richard Lewis. Night. <laughs>